Prime Minister says that everybody wants to do business with Israel for three reasons, technology, technology, technology. Uh, and so we're, we're excited to see what's happening today. But countered a, a, as, a, as a response to the embassies moving from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv in the beginning of the 80s, an organization was founded called the International Christian Chamber of Commerce, uh, International Christian Embassy of Jerusalem, I'm sorry. And what the International Christian Embassy said was, uh, why don't we uh, gather together and represent evangelical Christian believers like you from around the nations and show them that although the world is moving its embassies away from Jerusalem, we're going to establish an embassy in Jerusalem, uh, a place to build diplomatic relations and to really uh, uh, strengthen uh, the diplomatic status, security, and economy of Israel. Uh, and they've done a lot of wonderful humanitarian projects. I could, I could speak here for a long time about them. Uh, Jürgen Bueller, who you're about to hear from, is currently the international executive director of the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. He happens to be a very good friend of mine uh, and almost neighbors. We live uh, uh, in one neighborhood apart. Uh, and just a, a, a strong leader who's for years taken a very strong stand on behalf of this nation. I know that you just sat down, but maybe we could just stand up and greet Jürgen as he comes up and shares some thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Um, Khalif, congratulations for this amazing conference. It's uh, what I see an amazing a concept that you came up with and I believe as what we see already now it is very successful and I believe this will not be the last conference that we are having uh, in, in this scope so thanks so much for allowing us to partner with this amazing uh, conference and greetings to all of you from the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem um, I encourage you to go on our website www.icej.org and you can find out more about the many projects the Christian Embassy is carrying out in Israel. It's very natural for us to be here because one of the founding mandates, there were six founding mandates of the Christian Embassy, was to foster economic relationships between Christians around the world and the nation of Israel. So for us to be here today, Today. It's very fulfilling and it really fits and, and it meets the target of the calling and the mandate of the ICJ. Uh, please allow me to talk to you about um, what is taking place here, to explain a little bit the unique dynamic that is taking place, going to take place in this hall, in this convention center, where Israeli slash Jewish business leaders are meeting with mostly evangelical counterparts. And this is quite a historic endeavor that is taking place right now, because as we all know, Jewish-Christian relations for almost 2,000 years, they have been very bad to disastrous. I come from Germany, the nation that wrote the darkest chapter of Jewish history. So for us to sit together today in harmony is everything else than business as usual. But why is it that we are gathering here today? I want to quote, uh, first of all, Mr. Shimon Peres. The first point I want to stretch is that there is a new day of Jewish-Christian relations today. Shimon Peres said a few years ago at the President's House, at the reception for Christian leaders, he says, these are the best days in Jewish-Christian relationships ever. And I want to a little bit more be a, a little bit more uh, precise than he was. I believe these are the best days ever between evangelical Christians and the nation of Israel or Jewish people. Because to face the fact, not all Christians would actually would feel welcome and at home in a gathering like that. But it's the evangelical community around the world that had uh, taken up the burden and the calling to partner up with the nation of Israel. There are many signs that we are living in a new day of Jewish-Christian relations. I just met yesterday one of the directors of Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem, the organization that is commemorating the darkest chapter of Jewish-Christian relations, the Holocaust, they have today a Christian desk at their institution welcoming Christians from all around the world. Um, 
The Knesset, the Knesset Christian Allies Caucus has a specific caucus just to reach out to evangelical Christians around the world. Uh, we just had a few days ago from the, gov the government press office under the auspices of the Prime Minister a media summit geared directly to evangelical, to Christian media leaders, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, not only there at this summit, but repeatedly he said, evangelical Christians are Israel's best friends today. And this is not only what the Prime Minister said, but many government leaders in Israel today say this. And what a change that is. If you think about 40 years ago, uh, Caliph has told the story about the Christian embassy being established in Jerusalem. The early leaders are telling me how difficult it was to convince Israelis to come to a Christian meeting. And today, almost every big Israeli organization is opening a Christian desk in their institution because they realize these are the partners for us for the future. Today, around 20% of the Jews who make Aliyah do come to Israel because they are financed by Christians from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, even from villages in Tanzania. We had recently a conference in Tanzania, and we were very touched when one of the villagers came to us. And he gave us a donation of $3,000. He says we were selling actually quite a number of goats in our village in order to get this money. And they said the money is there in order to help our African brothers, the Ethiopian Jews, to go back to Israel. And uh, I could give you many examples. One of the leaders of this movement is sitting here today, Thomas Sandow, who is uh, leading a political initiative in Europe and in the United Nations, uh, advocating for Israel from an evangelical and a Christian perspective. We just celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles where we welcomed around 7,000 pilgrims from more than 100 nations walking through the streets of Jerusalem, showing their solidarity and friendship. So, it is indeed a new day of Jewish-Christian relationships today, so it makes sense to have this conference here today. <laughs> Secondly, this conference makes more than sense because I believe what is happening in this room today is the gathering of the, most, of the two most dynamic and successful movements in the world. I repeat it. It's uh, representatives of the two most dynamic and successful movements in the world are meeting here in this room. Interestingly enough, both of them were established more or less at the, at the same time, at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Uh, we, of course, know one story from uh, the famous Jewish journalist Theodor Herzl, who started the Zionist movement by publishing the book Der Judenstaat, and uh, the result of that is today the state of Israel as we see it. The other one was maybe less recognized a few thousand kilometers to the west in the city of Los Angeles in a small church in Azusa Street. One of the most dynamic revival movements started, which was called the Azusa Street Revival, which is spreading today around the world and has members Conservative estimates believe that there are 750 million members of this revivalist evangelical movement around the world. And let me tell you, those 750 million people, they are Israel's best friends today. So in this hall today, those two people groups are gathering evangelical Christian, the fastest growing religious group in the world, and the success story of the nation of Israel, the Zionist movement. They are merging hands today together, and I believe the outcome will be incredible. Let me first tell you a little bit who we are, the evangelicals. As I told you, we have some 750 million followers around the world. If you read the book of Philip Jenkins, The Next Christendom, he expects that uh, by the next 20 years, this movement will surpass 1 billion members around the world. Just, just if you look to Africa in 1970, or let's even go back to the 1900s, there were around 
10 million Christians, half of them evangelicals in the continent of Africa. By 1970, there were 143 million. In 2010, seven years ago, there were almost 500 million evangelical Christians only in the continent of Africa. Some of them don't subscribe to a uh, traditional evangelical churches, they go to Catholic and Anglican churches, but probably they are from their nature and characteristic more evangelical than some churches in Europe even. Um, in 2050, he, pro he, he uh, projects that we will have just in Africa more than one billion Christians living in Africa. And again, this means one billion people who are friends of the state of Israel. I could give you a similar number from Asia, from Latin America, where the growth of evangelicals is just staggering. We have to see that this movement is not just a religious movement, but they basically they define themselves through three, to, uh, by three things. Number one, they believe in the Bible, which is a Jewish book. Our Bible, the, the Tanakh, which we call the Old Testament, was written here in this land. And even what many people don't know, our Christian writings, the New Testament, were all written by Jews here from the land. One was the, was the disciple of one of the famous rabbis here in Israel, Rabbi Gamliel. His disciples was one of the first Christians and wrote our holy writings. So they identify very strongly through the Bible with this nation. Secondly, of course, and this is probably the biggest difference to, between Jews and Christians, we believe that Jesus or Yeshua, he is our Messiah. But thirdly, wherever you go, and we are traveling around the world to move even meet evangelical Christians, wherever you go, those Christians, they love Israel. They want to come to Israel, they want to support Israel, they want to make business with Israel. One movement in Brazil that we are very closely affiliated with them, uh, you cannot become a leader in that movement until you commit at least once a year you are visiting the land of Israel. And that's quite amazing, you know, the, uh, to think about that. <clears throat> This movement, again, is not just religious, but has significant political impact. We see it right now in the United States. Uh, it was the evangelical vote that brought the current president into office. Um, it was the evangelical voice that made the government of Guatemala move their embassy to Jerusalem following the Trump administration. Uh, it was the evangelical vote that affected right now the Brazilian election voting for Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, it was the main reason, we have to say, why Prime Minister Netanyahu and his cabinet take a large, a huge focus on Africa because many of the government leaders in Africa today are evangelical Christians. And uh, you see it as a wave of tourism coming from Southeast Asia, uh, China, Taiwan. We had only at the Feast of Tabernacles, only from China, 600 pilgrims coming this year. And the numbers are growing every single year. And of course, it's an increase of financial investment from Southeast Asia. Many of those people are evangelical Christians. Secondly, so the first group, a uh, very dynamic group, is the evangelical community. The second group, of course, and that's what I am, to be very honest, even though I'm an evangelical, I'm even more excited. That's the state of Israel. I don't think there is a more dynamic state than the country of Israel today. Israel, as a matter of fact, was the very first country that already had a university before there was a state, the Hebrew University. It was the only country in the world which already had a national philharmonic orchestra before there was a state of Israel. And then when the state of Israel was established, it just took off to an incredible dynamic. And I'm quoting here some numbers from a book from a lady called Noga Canaan. I encourage you all to buy it. It's called Israel, an Island of Success. And she writes in her book that the GDP in Israel only in the last 30 years uh, rose almost a thousand percent. The export volume in the same period rose almost 900 percent. The R&D research and development spending in Israel is the highest in the whole world per capita. There is no nation that invests more in research and development than Israel. The first Israeli satellite 
it's something that symbolizes uh, that de development in an incredible way. You know, if you think about the eight nations that have their own space program and sending up satellites, uh, satellites into the space, they are huge nations like Russia and France and United Kingdom and United States, big players. And then there is tiny Israel who is sending up a satellite into the space. Why did they do it? Menachem Begin started a satellite program. Why? Because there was a peace treaty with Egypt. Why was this the reason for a satellite program? Because Israel was now with a peace treaty not allowed anymore to send spy planes over Egypt. So they said, we need satellites. But there was a problem, unlike in any country where you launch a rocket up into space, usually they go eastward because this is in the opposite direction like our Earth rotates. Israel cannot send out satellites to east because they would fly over nations like Iraq and Saudi Arabia and they wouldn't like satellites to, uh, to be launched over their territory. So Israel was forced to launch from the Negev towards the west. No other nation is doing that. But in order to overcome the obstacle of the extra speed they need, they said, well, let's just reduce the size of our satellites. And that's why Israel today is the world leader in satellite technology for microsatellite and a whole new branch which are even called nanosatellites. Now, if you talk about a nanosatellite, these are of the size of 10 kilograms or less. And I think this is something which just symbolizes how Israel uses their challenges in order, in order to become an incredibly successful nation. That's why Israel is the number one in business exp expenditure in research and development. It's the number one nation in cyber security. It's the second country in the world regarding scientific research. But even there, it's the number one nation in research papers per capita. No other nation publishes more scientific papers per capita than Israel. Israel is the number one nation as a Nobel Prize recipient. Um, Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, was recently here in Israel. He said there are two technology hubs in the world. One is Silicon Valley. The other one is the nation of Israel. And then he added, if you want to have something really quickly and effective done, you don't go to Silicon Valley, you come here to the nation of Israel. More than 300 big companies have their R&D centers here in Israel, and many of them you know, HP, IBM, Oracle, Intel, Google. I just learned that a number of German car manufacturers are moving their research centers uh, to outside of Tel Aviv in order to research automated driving. Somehow they can't get it sorted out in Germany or in Stuttgart, so they have to come to Tel Aviv. And Microsoft, Steve Ballmer, the second CEO, of Microsoft, he said, um, Microsoft today is almost as much an Israeli company as it is an American company. And I experienced this personally just a few months ago. I was flying back to Israel and I was sitting in the plane and I asked a gentleman beside me, he says, where do you come from? I said, I'm coming from Seattle. And I said, oh, the city of Microsoft. And he looked at me and said, yes, that's where I'm working. And he said, I asked him, so which department are you working? He says, well, I'm working in the department which makes the Surface tablets. And I said, oh, I know them. I just bought one for my son. And I, have, I told him, he says, to be very honest, there is a problem. My son always complains about the pen where you can write on the, on the screen. And he looked at me. He says, I'm the department head of that department. And he says, that's why I'm, in the, that, why I'm sitting in the airplane. I'm flying to Israel because they were telling me the scientists in Israel, they can solve our problem from uh, Seattle. And this shows you how amazing this nation today is. <laughs> Israel is the youngest population, has the youngest population in the OECD uh, community. Uh, families are considered here in this land not as an obstacle, but as a blessing. A research done recently around uh, in the OECD countries, they ask our Western countries, Germany, one child per family, why do you have so uh, few children in your family? The answer everybody said was because of personal development. 
And the same answer in every nation. And they came to Israel. The average family has three and a half to four children. Why do you have so much children, so many children? The answer was because of personal development. <laughs> it's a complete different mindset how, do, how you look at families. It's the only nation, by the way, where the desert is not expanding, but it's retreating. Every other nation, the, the, passive, the desert is, is growing out. I see I'm running out of time here. But Israel, to cut it short, is an amazing country to all the Christian investors who are here in the land and who are here at this conference. To invest here in the land is the most smartest thing that you can do for your business because this is the most advanced and growing nation that you can find on our whole planet. And finally, and with this I have three minutes, I understand, or five minutes, um, why are we working here together? And this is, I believe, um, what, com what unifies us, not just that we come from two dynamic movements, but that we have a shared value system. Uh, both of our Bible teaches us that we as human beings are created in the image of God. The way how God created us in the Garden of Eden was not a concept like you have it in Islam today, where they say, well, if something goes wrong, if something doesn't go right, inshallah, this is the will of Allah, we can't fix it. God, from the very beginning, told his people, you research and you tend the God.